Well, thank you all for being here. I think we could probably get started. Chelsea, Amanda, what do you think? All right, yeah. Re ready yeah. when you are. <laughs> Great. Um, well, hi everyone. My name is Megan Bernstein. I'm the Alumni Engagement Manager at Marlboro, and I can hardly believe that I'm welcoming you to our final aiming high of this season, I guess. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us uh, throughout this aiming high series. It was kind of a bit of an experiment during this excessively virtual, necessary, but excessively virtual time. Um, and I've really come to look forward to every month's event. And I hope that um, all of you have felt the same throughout all of this. Um, so as we get going, I'll just remind you to please use the Q&A box if you do have a question for our speakers this evening. Um, you can find that just at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And um, you can use the chat for everything else, but I will um, definitely see your questions if it ends up in that Q&A box. So that's the best place for those. And uh, that, is, that is really it. So now I really have the distinct pleasure and joy of introducing <laughs> our speakers uh, tonight, Chelsea Dern and Amanda Smith, both from the class of 2011. Um, it's so, so good to have you both here. And I think I'll just, rather than droning on and on and on, I think I'll just ask you to kick us off by introducing yourself, um, share a little bit about you, personal, professional, all the things we should, we should know about you. Chelsea, you want to take it? Sure, I'll go first. Um, I'm Chelsea. I'm the class of 2011, which is Megan's class as well. Uh, I am obviously from Los Angeles. I went to GW also with Megan, <laughs> uh, where I studied journalism and political science. I very much thought I was going to be a journalist. I am not, obviously. Uh, my senior year, I realized my heart was really in entertainment. I had grown up a huge TV junkie, loved it, still love it to death. Sarah Diaz, who is on and is my best friend, can vouch that I didn't watch a new show basically once a week. Um, but yes, I uh, started started working at WME basically right after college. I started in the mailroom, which like we can explain later if nobody knows what that means. But uh, from there, I worked my way up. I worked for a few agents in our TV scripted department. So agents who work with uh, television writers, producers, and directors. Uh, from there, I worked for our CEO, Ari Emanuel, for a year and a half. And then I was uh, our department coordinator for a year and a half. And then I was promoted to agent at the end of 2019, also in TV scripted. Uh, and so then I had a few months as an agent in the office and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so I've been an agent from home ever since then, uh, but it's been great. And so, yeah, as I said, I work with television writers and showrunners and uh, producers and directors. And that's my spiel, I think. I, I don't know if I left anything out. So that's, it's a good, it's a good spiel. Um, you know, it's a, Amanda Smith, class of uh, 2011 as well, um, born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, I guess Megan and I go back to the days of the seventh grade play, which I originally <laughs> thought I would be involved in uh, theater and music and whatnot. Um, I went to Stanford for undergrad, uh, where I studied psychology and communication and a, a lot of music on the side. Um, and partway through school, I uh, realized that I absolutely loved performing, but did not want to spend my life being a performer. Um, and after a little bit of soul searching, it was like, what is the way that I still feel creatively connected in my job? You know, well, LA movies, this is, this is the, the thing that I love and I love telling stories, um, but to get to do it from the perspective of not the performer. Um, and I graduated in 2015 and I started at Gersh um, was there for the last five and a half years. Um, and I currently work at uh, UTA, United Talent Agency, and started just over two months ago. Um, I work in the feature list department. So a very similar thing to Chelsea, but um, I work with um, writers and directors primarily on the movie side. The movies are my love. Thank you, that's great. Um, and congratulations on the new-ish job, Amanda. I know that was yeah. quite the transition, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so I guess next, can you tell us, and Chelsea, you sort of alluded to this with the mailroom. Can you tell us a little bit like 
about what you do. What does the day-to-day look like for you? What's the sort of the scope of your work as an agent for TV and, and feature? And then maybe if we want to wrap a lot into a question, sort of talk about like your journey from the mailroom to, to where you are now. Do we want to I mean, go, you go first? first. No, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> such, a, such a big um, question. Um, you know, in terms of what it looks like now, I think like one of the reasons why I love agency work is you feel like you get to wear a different hat every single day. Um, you know, it, it's part-time deal maker, a little bit of the attorney brain in there, even though I don't have an actual law degree. It's why I love our lawyer friends. Um, a little bit of the management side where it's a lot of reading scripts and helping development material and walking clients through, you know, how to triage their time and amplify their voices. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a therapist hat too, you know, <laughs> walking people through the things that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, you know, it, it feels like it's a very changing and unpredictable job, which again, one of the things that I love, it's very, very client dependent. Um, and, you know, some days it's all about those negotiations and other days it's looking for work. Like the, the bulk of the time is putting together projects. Like what are the things that we can sell? And then what are the jobs that we can find? That's, that's the, that's the day-to-day -day now we can, we can walk back in terms of kind of where we started for a second. Uh, I agree. Amanda explained that perfectly. It is a lot of hats, uh, a lot of therapy, um, but it's, it's definitely, it's never boring, which is great. Every day I really have no idea what will happen and what my work schedule will entail. Um, for the process of like mailroom to everything, I guess I can touch on that. So the mailroom, if you guys don't know, there's a book called The Mailroom, which you can read, which is just horror stories. And I swear it's not as bad as it makes it sound. But the mailroom is basically the same at all agencies, which I think is a very nice unifier. Uh, they hire basically people right out of college for the most part, right out of grad school. Um, and your job, at least for WME, is you're literally delivering mail. So it's a little bit odd to have just graduated college and work so hard at Marlboro, work so hard in college and be like, hello, this is your letter from the bank. Like, it's just very random. But in addition to literally delivering mail, uh, you're also supposed to be learning, you know, people in the building, you are uh, covering for assistance if they're out. So you're getting to know agents and getting to know what the assistant job looks like, whether it's, you know, an assistant has a doctor's appointment, you're coming for two hours or an assistant is on vacation, you're coming for two weeks, whatever it may be. Um, and then from there, you really get to know people in the building. I got my first desk because I floated for this agent in our department who was traveling at the time and his assistant was gone. I didn't realize she was interviewing for another job. Um, and she came back and was like, I got it. And I was like, okay. And then he called me and was like, you did a good job floating. Do you want to be my new assistant? And that worked out very seamlessly for me. It doesn't always go that way, but it was very lucky. Um, and then from there, at least in the WME experience, you kind of jump from desk to desk. Obviously not everyone who comes into the mail and wants to be an agent. A lot of people just want to be introduced to the entertainment world. And I think the mail room and the, you know, entry assistant level jobs are really great to teach you what an agency is, what a producer does, what a studio exec does, all of that. Um, and then people kind of can make their own decisions from there of, oh, I don't want to be an agent, but I really am interested in what this client who works on this show does. Maybe I want to be a writer. Maybe I want to be a director. And so it's a great way to just learn all of that. But usually uh, for the people who want to be agents, the goal is, you know, move mailroom, move a few desks around, eventually become for WME, you become the coordinator first and then you get promoted to agent. And that's kind of the, the normal route. It varies from everyone, but that's, that's the gist. And one of the, the reasons why it's so helpful at that stage and why you float or whatever it is, you know, people refer to agencies as being like the neural network, like the, the brain of the entire industry. And if you work at a studio or if you work at a smaller production company, you know, typically, you know, all the projects that that studio is working on, you're much more siloed, but at an agency, because you're trying to look for work and you're trying to sell things all over town, like you have to know what's happening at truly every studio. What I liked where I was going. Oh no, maybe we'll catch up. Oh, oh she's back. You're back. Oh, am I back? Oh my goodness. Oh. 
Oh no, where, where did I cut out? Uh, studios, you have to know everything that's going yeah. on. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, you have to know everything that's going on. And so, you know, people say that an agency is like grad school, you know, for people starting their first job in entertainment because you truly have to know everything that's happening in the brain of the industry. That's great. Um, and sounds like a lot of really hard work and sort of just like grueling, grueling hours that you kind of put in to get to where you are now is, I mean, is that an accurate <laughs> description? <laughs> I would say that's accurate. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think for me, I, when I work for RER CEO, you, I had insane hours. And so nothing has quite beaten those, but I've gotten close. Um, but I think especially even during the pandemic, and I'm sure I'm going to feel the same way, like there's been such a blurring of work and personal life and all that, that I feel like I'm kind of working all the time because some, everyone, now everyone texts me instead of like calling me through my office and all of that. And I think people expect answers much quickly because they're kind of like, what else are you doing <laughs> besides sitting at home, avoiding a pandemic? Um, so I think the hours have gotten a little crazier if that's even possible, but yeah, the hours can be tough. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the things that makes it harder with the hours too is not only has the pandemic blurred, you know, our own lives of, you know, here, here's work, here's home, everyone can text you all the time. Like that certainly has been the case, but there's a lot of this job that's wonderfully fun. And whether that's getting drinks with clients or meeting people in the industry, it's a very, very social job which means that those hours often get expanded because, you know, you're meeting someone at 8.30 in the morning for, and again, it's the old days, but, you know, you're meeting someone for a coffee or you're going to a screening at night. And it's easy to forget sometimes that it's work because you're seeing a movie. It's I think she's going to say it's fun, <laughs> which it is. It is. It, am I back? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wait, wait oh, please. It, it is fine. You're seeing please, a movie. Yeah. Out. Yes. You're seeing a movie and it's fun. Um, but it certainly means that the hours get stretched because there's a lot to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think too, in a city like, well, not even just in LA, but as Chelsea said, there's always a new show to binge or a new movie to watch. And that for you is sort of work at times, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so besides the, you know, not being in the office and not being able to go to screenings and, and meet with people, how has the pandemic affected your work um, beyond that, even just with your, with your clients and with the, the, the way that they're working or the projects that are available and things like that? You want to go? It's been tough. Yeah. No, I mean, I think like it's, it's wonderful to like sit here and enjoy the things that are really fun about this job. Um, but everyone's been hit differently. Um, look, I have some writers who had a fantastic year last year because writers can work from home and we were able to keep going. And some people who had projects pulled and things shut down. I mean, it, it really was a person to person, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to see things get shut down and a lot of people lose jobs when productions have to shut. Yeah, I agree with that a lot. I think people are feeling much more positive now, now that productions are able to start up again and people are able to actually see each other again. But I think the first few months were really, really terrifying and horrible for a lot of people because they just didn't know when they were going to be able to actually work again. Um, so it definitely was very tough for a few months. I think what a lot of people forget too is even the people that are incredibly successful in this business and you know part of the reason why people have reps is a lot of these jobs for most of people's lives are freelance or they're job to job and you know their their health insurance and different things depend on the work that they get um so I mean it's something that like again for all the for all the fun things and working in entertainment I think like we take very very seriously because these are people's livelihoods and that's very very scary when you don't know where your next job is coming from yeah yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm glad things are starting to sort of turn around, hopefully. Yeah, well, it has to be a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, <laughs> oh no, I cut her off and then she froze. Okay. 
Oh, wait a second. Did I, did I at least freeze in a cute way? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you. Um, just tell me I did, even if I didn't. <laughs> uh, what were you going to say, though? I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, so the, the, uh, things are optimistically turning around. I think there's a lot more hope in production right now. Oh, good. That's great. I'd love to pivot a little bit to talk about you and, and your time at Marlboro and some of the things you were involved in uh, when we were students. Looking, looking back on that time, do you feel like I don't know, are you surprised with where you've ended up? Were there things you were involved in that feel a little similar? I mean, I know you both said you sort of went to college thinking you'd be doing something else and then kind of went into this, but anyway, talk, talk me through some of that stuff. Yeah, I think for me, I was, um, my big thing outside of just normal Marlboro, I think was the yearbook. I was on it for all of like the high school years and I think that's originally what led me to wanting to do journalism kind of, but now that I think back on it, it very much was like, I enjoyed storytelling and like looking back at memories, which I think is a lot of what like scripts are. Um, so I think I now can see the lines to what connected it in the moment. I wasn't like, I'm going to work. And I had no idea. It, realistically, I had no idea what I was going to do. I think I left Marvel being like, journalism sounds okay. And then kind of went with it. And then my senior year was like, this is not making a ton of sense for me. Um, but yeah, when I think back to Marlboro, besides like the fun times I had actually like with my friends, all that, like, I think I really enjoyed um, watching TV after school and my mom was very strict that I wasn't allowed to watch TV until after I finished everything and so I would rush to finish my homework and I would come home from sports practice and all of that and be like I just want to watch Gossip Girl like that and so now I can see like I was so addicted to TV and it was very much used as like a if you finish this you can do that and now it makes sense to me that I just love it so much and always have so I think that's it for me um but I'll think on it more. Maybe there's something else I'm not thinking. <laughs> it's, it's funny to think about like what that through line is. I was not a like media junkie by any means in high school. Like I don't think I discovered Friends or Gilmore Girls till we were in college. Like I was behind the times, you know. <laughs> but I always, I always loved the arts in general. Like. I, was singing in choir at Marlboro and I was always you know in the the visual arts department too and, and doing theater like I think I always had that appreciation for it um but I certainly had no idea and despite the fact that like we grew up in LA I knew very little about the movie industry um and I think it was not necessarily the things that I did in high school that made me fall in love with film, but I do think that there are certain things that I loved about Marlboro that make me like appreciate my job. Like I, I we spend a lot of time analyzing scripts, giving notes, being very, very hands-on. Um, and like, I certainly feel like I have a lot to like fall back on in terms of being analytical with material that I'm really grateful for. <laughs> That's great. And actually sort of feeds perfectly into one of the questions that came into the Q&A, which is, and maybe you, maybe you have to answer this a little bit anonymously and we won't, we don't want to get anyone in trouble, but what, is there something that you've read that you thought was just not great, not great material, but ended up getting made? And then on the flip side, something that was just so astonishing or excellent and it didn't, didn't make it to our eyes, our screens. <laughs> I think the second one is easier to answer because I think uh, there's so much TV out there and like Netflix truly releases a new show every 50 seconds. And so I think, and I feel like the same can be said for the film side, like there's so much content out there that I think people think like everything gets made and a lot of, and the truth is very little actually gets made. Um, and out of like the 100 scripts I read, like one actually makes it. And so I think I, I can't specifically say like one specific script that was amazing because I've read a lot that were just wonderful and amazing and fantastic and had a great writer and a great director and great actors, all that. And it just, it just died in the development process before getting greenlight. And that's pretty common. And it's super heartbreaking, especially if it's like a project your client worked on and like has poured their life into and you're like, 
it was amazing. Like there's nothing to say. It just wasn't like either the right time or there was another show. Oh no, we lost it. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think it's tough because it really depends on so many variables and whether there's another show out there that's similar to it or if it's like not the right time for the show or if a network is like, oh, we already have too many period dramas about women. I don't know. There's so many answers that you can get that are just like, enough for a show to be knocked out and so there are a lot I've read that I'm like this is amazing and it just doesn't go anywhere um yeah there are a few really bad ones I've read though <laughs> that have gotten in I'm like okay that's great for them <laughs> not as many but a few sorry sorry to keep dropping I hope I'm back now for good I restarted sure. my my internet um it's such a good question too I'm, I you answered that so gracefully I mean, look, here, here's the thing that like, I feel like you have to contend with as a rep is that like, you will pass on people who you don't necessarily get, but like, will go on to be successful. And you will take on people that you believe in that may take a really long time to hit. And the, the ideal is, you know, obviously that it happens quickly and whatnot, and that we all like to think we have like a <laughs> great taste, but there are things that I fully, I mean, like there, there's the person out there who like at a studio passed on Star Trek, you know, and is kicking themselves. Um, things that I, there are certain like books that people have loved over the years that I never fully understand. Like I would have been the person who passed on the Hunger Games. I still don't get it. I still like, I, I just don't like kids killing kids. It's not my taste. I would have lost out on a lot of money. Um, but in terms of things that like, you know, that haven't got made. Oh God, there's so many good scripts out there that haven't gotten made. I have to think about that one more. There's, there's a lot of great content. Yeah, it sort of makes you appreciate all that, sure. that does get made and all the sort of heart and soul that goes into every single thing we're consuming, even if we happen to think it's terrible. Well, yeah. What's what's funny, so we have these things called, called grids and it's, you know, where we keep all of our content information. If you really like want a, a blast from the past, like there are projects that are still looking for filmmakers that are fully set up at studios that have been around since before we were born. And there are projects that have come around a number of times and that a director comes on and a director falls off. And, you know, it's, it's a, an, an old mentor of mine re referred to it as the movie gods. You know, if the movie gods wanted it to be so, like they will, and there's no rhyme or reason. Yeah. It, it has to make people nervous, but it's also very exciting and sort of great when something does end up happening for them. Yeah. And, and sort of on that topic, and this is in the Q&A as well, and I had written a question about this, or actually, sorry, someone had sent me a question about this earlier, but how does someone, how does someone go about finding an agent, getting an agent, and how, how do you, on the flip side, how are you discovering new talent and, and finding, finding new folks to, to work with? It, it's such a mixed bag and like, so not scientific. I mean, I tend to, and I, I hate like that there's kind of a barrier to entry in a lot of ways in this business, but I trust the taste of a lot of the people who, you know, I work with not, I mean, both within my company, but also externally, the producers, the executives that I work with. So oftentimes it's, you know, a question of like, who are they working with? Who are they liking? you know, the managers that I work with, the attorneys that I work with, um, particularly because again, this business is a lot of fun. And so for me, if I can find those partners that not only have fantastic taste, but that are the people that I want to build out a client with, to me, that's really exciting when there's a team that really, really works together. Um, you know, and, and I also think that there's a right time for an agent to be involved. It's very dependent on the client. Sometimes someone needs a manager first, sometimes they don't. Sometimes, you know, people have full teams. It's, it, again, there's no science to it. Um, but agents are very, very additive. Usually when there's the time to go out and try and sell something. Um, and, you know, so if an agent's going to be involved, like, you know, someone might need a manager to develop a script and projects first. Um, the timing, again, there's no right or wrong answer to it. Yeah, I would agree with everything Amanda said. It's a lot of times I'm finding scripts and talent and all that through 
people I know and I trust, like a lot of times it'll be managers and friends with or lawyers or um, an executive at a production company will be like, I read this great person, blah, blah, blah. And it comes through that way. Sometimes it is if like, there's a show I'm obsessed with and I'll just be like, who wrote this episode? It's so good. And I'll look up, look it up and go that way. But a lot of times I think it does come through kind of a word of mouth situation. It's, it's fun though, because it's a very um, freeing job in a lot of ways to kind of follow the people that you are passionate about. Um, so I tend to, you know, not, not that anyone is, I don't want to like be boxed into a particular genre because I like a lot of different things, but there are certain areas that I am really passionate and excited about. And so if there's, again, something that I like, you kind of have the freedom to go out there and say, okay, this person is focusing on these issues or this genre, or, you know, I really want to focus on, you know, comedy writers and whatnot. And you can kind of hone in that way when it comes to your particular case and be, um, pursuing things outwardly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Can you just briefly sort of explain for anyone who doesn't know the difference between what you are, what you do as an agent and what someone's manager would do or someone else on their team that's sort of also <laughs> representing them differently? You, I, I, you, you get this question yeah. first. <laughs> um, we can answer in tandem. It's, you know, I think it depends on the manager and on the client. Honestly, I think everyone's relationships are different. I think there are some clients I work with where I would describe my relationship as like a little bit more managery, but I, the way I've always thought about it is, and what Amanda said before is great of like, sometimes a client needs a manager first and like an agent isn't necessary. I think that's for great for writers or whatever actors, directors, whoever, um, who are starting out and kind of need the like initial guidance of like, this is how you craft this script to be great. Like those types of things. I feel like managers a lot of times are very involved in a lot of the very specific details of everything going on. And I think they're kind of a lot of times, I don't want to say like point guard, I don't know how the best way, like a little bit of like a team captain in some cases where they kind of have an idea of like everything, especially like I work with like a lot of multi hyphenate talents. So they're writers, directors, actors, producers, or just like writer comedians and whatever it is that I feel like their managers are kind of touching all the areas a bit. And then I come in and I'm like the specific person working on their TV stuff. Um, I don't know if I did a great job explaining that, Amanda. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a I mean, honestly, the, the real question is how many times have you been asked this question in yeah. your time? Like, <laughs> we got asked this a lot. My answer should um, be better by now. It's, and it's one of those things where like people's roles sort of like change, you know, on a client specific basis. Um, manage, I always think a great manager is someone who is fantastic at finding material, finding those nuggets of ideas. They're really good development partners. They get nitty gritty on drafts. Um, again, these are all things that See, a really good manager does things that also a really good agent does and a really good agent does things a really good manager does. Um, an agent is licensed by the state of California to negotiate deals on behalf of a client, unlike managers, um, like, or like you can procure work for a client. It's um, different, there's different legal definitions. Um, an agent is more on the day-to-day -day of the job hunting. So again, a good manager who is a good partner will often be a job hunter. Um, and it, there's just a little bit more of, um, again, like maybe the day-to-day -day things, like I'm probably not going to be booking a flight for my client, but a manager might do that. But a manager is probably going to have far less of a detailed relationship with like an attorney than I would, because we're going to get like far more into the nitty gritty of like the actual deal. That was a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. There's two. It's, it's, a, it's a weird, weird question. I'm like, the lines do get blurred. Um, Very blurry, again, yeah. This is why it, it's, it is wonderful when managers and agents kind of come together with those clients because when you find this energy that really, really works, um, it's helpful for everyone. Yeah, yeah. great. Well, this is sort of veering uh, away from that question, but Amanda, you mentioned a mentor that you had and I wanted to ask both of you if, if mentorship has played an important role in your life and then of course in in these um these careers as well and if you could just talk a little bit about that yeah 
I am um, my second boss at WME, I say is my mentor always because he like is really the reason I became an agent and he's been super protective of my like career choices and all that. And I think I got off track a bit when I was working for Ari just because it's a crazy job and working for, I think the CEO of any company is probably very exhausting, but Ari is technically the CEO of Endeavor, which is our parent company. And that encapsulates WME, IMG, which is models of sports, the UFC, and a lot of much smaller companies that aren't even coming to mind. And so that, and when you work for Ari, he has three assistants. I, I don't know if this is valuable information, but you're one of three assistants and it's really crazy hours and you're expected to have a second phone on at all times and you are in the office at 7 a.m. It's really crazy. So there was a time period where I really was like, is this a, a thing that I can do for much longer? It's it's crazy. It's really draining. Um, Sarah Diaz can also attest to that because I would call her being like, oh my God. Um, but yeah, I think it's a mentorship is so helpful when it works well, I think. And for me, my second boss at the company, <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, my second boss at the company was great when I worked for him just because I, I learned a lot about what it is to be a scripted agent from him. And then once I left his desk, he was super supportive of me and all the decisions I was making, but also was great at guiding me, especially when I was on our desk being like, you can make it, you will become an agent after this, like all of that and remind me of that. And then He's just always been wonderful for general advice and guidance. And I ask him every silly question I ever have because I know he's not going to get like upset with me. Um, but I think entertainment is great and I love it. And it's a wonderful industry and there's so many great parts, but it can also be really tiring and really grueling and really tough. And if you are someone who works for a boss who isn't nice or works at a company that doesn't treat you with respect, it can be really tough. Um, so I think it's this industry and probably all industries, but this industry specifically, I think makes it very necessary to have someone who specifically has your back and is there to support you. Yeah, there's so much in this business that feels like it's designed to again, like be a gatekeeper in some way. And I feel like I've gotten so lucky with the people that have said yes to me for some random reason, you know, and it's because like they wanted to set up an environment where they make you feel like, you know, we're, we're going to help you. And then it makes you want to pay it forward. Um, so I feel like I've gotten really lucky and I have always wanted to be someone who, you know, I'll, I'll read anything that comes to me. And I, I may not be the person who can necessarily jump in and help, but like I've only gotten opportunities because people have said yes to me and have answered all my questions and have given me guidance and how to even ask for help, which are things that like, you know, it's, it, it's hard to have someone sit you down and say, hey, I want to help you. How can you structure the things that you need help with so I can be the most effective to you? So I feel like I've gotten some really amazing people that have like come along that way. Um, and, you know, part of the, the crazy part of being an assistant and coming up in the agency world is you're on everyone's phone, you're on your boss's phone calls and you hear truly everything, which in some ways is very strange. You really get to know a person's brain in a way that you didn't think you ever needed to. But in a lot of ways too, some of this business is truly crafted by giving people the opportunity to hear how deals are made, to hear how phone calls go. Um, and so there's the outward mentorship, but then also this like, come in and listen and, you know, you take what you will. And um, it's a very unique way of learning, um, but I think it's just so incredibly important. And I think one of the things that I don't want to take for granted in the pandemic is a lot of the communication has been cut off between bosses and people who are just calling people on their cell phones. And, you know, I, we, we don't have people listening into our calls on the same way because, easy just to call people directly. You're not in the office, you're not in the car in the same way. Um, but I certainly feel like I had some mentors who, you know, are good reminders of the importance of outreach on our end because it can be a difficult business to learn and particularly now when communication is cut off. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't, Chelsea looked like maybe she had something to add, so I was just pausing. No, I'm just like impressed by Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed by you. Like, honestly, I, I feel so lucky that we get to like do this together. And like, honestly, I don't know if either one of us knew we were going to end up in this business, but like, no. it's, it's really 
it's a cool thing that we've gotten to like see each other yeah. come up in these different places. Yeah, that's great. Um, so two similar sort of similar questions came into the Q and A, which is uh, sort of about Im an impact that you would like to have on Hollywood on the industry. Um, is there one big change you'd like to see, or a particular? trend or issue that you feel particularly invested in in sort of shifting within the industry yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah so where do we start you yeah know? i don't know if i can pick one um i think amanda and i both started in this industry you know five and a half years ago and i think even from then to now it's changed quite a bit, which is shocking because it doesn't feel like that much time, but really a lot has changed. And I think Me Too was a big part of that. Um, I think for me, a big goal of mine is specifically to work with women of color as women of color and to work with diversity across all realms, whether that be someone who's queer, someone who's black, someone who doesn't identify by anything. And I just think the more we can like Amanda said, this, this is an industry of gatekeepers. And so it really means a lot. I think when an agent is pushing someone who doesn't fit the normal archetype of what we expect, like I think in TV and film, a lot of the people who originally were the creators and the showers and the directors were straight white men who were, you know, doing fine, but there was very few differences outside of them on their staffs and on their crews and all that and so I think it's important for agents to really push the clients who don't fit that because if we're able to call a studio exec um, or a producer or whoever it be and be like you need to meet this person they are going to be the next Aaron Sorkin but they are a queer black woman like I think that's huge um, and so for me it's not one thing it's kind of all of those things of just like general pushing of diverse voices and I think so much of what I'm seeing now especially after the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that happened last summer is there was a huge huge reaction and now we're kind of getting into the point where like it's simmered down a bit and not everyone is calling you being like send me all your Black writers and now it's more like we have all settled and we're able to push people who are different than what we're used to but are also fantastic and should be known so I think for me that's been the goal from the beginning. And I think we're in a really great point where people are actually listening now. And that wasn't always the case. I think there were, have been a lot of agents at a time who've tried to do that and it just wasn't the time and people weren't really paying attention. So I think it's shifting a bit, but that is the general movement I would like to work on. Oh, that's so well said. I love, I, I love that. Yeah, that's, that's, Amanda and I are like obsessed with each other. <laughs> I just I'm so like no I'm just so in awe of you it's like it, it's so it's so true and it's so cool because like you've said it so perfectly and I not to sound trite but like amplifying voices is just what I want to do I am so passionate about seeing stories on screen that we have not seen before and it's fun and it's interesting and we're at a place where people are listening and you know, I, I think a, a colleague of mine talked about it. She's like, I want to tell stories that disrupt. And I just think that that's awesome. And I, you know, wish I could say it in my, in my own words as, as eloquently as, as you did, Chelsea, but that's like, that's exactly what I want to do. Um, you know, I'm particularly passionate about, like, I, I want to increase and also not just increase, but better the quality of like trans representation on screen. That's really important to me. And if you go back and look at, you know, the narratives that have existed, they're like pretty, um, horrific that have existed over the last 50 something years. That's something I'm um, very actively trying to um, work with, with um, clients to increase that representation on. Um, but honestly, just tell, telling good stories and the business has changed so much since, you know, we started and it felt like there was, um, you know, the Me Too has really changed a lot of things and this last year has changed I think just the reception in so many ways and I think for the better and I think we're just both really excited that people are listening yeah and everyone should watch the disclosure doc on Netflix about trans representation because it is 
shocking how horrible it's been over the last however many years so it's a very uh it's a great doc it's truly truly something good special and it's like one of those things where I think that that to me is a moment where that film completely encapsulated everything that I want to work with clients to do um because I watched that movie and it completely changed how I see media and so when I look for clients when I look for material what goes through my mind is, is this going to change the way that people see culture, people see life, like art can disrupt culture? What is the way that we are going to like get people to have massive social shifts through art? Um, and to me, a film like that did that so beautifully. Um, but that's one of the things that I feel like I really actively look for and I'm really interested in putting together. Well, I feel so grateful that both of you are out there doing this and you know, imp ultimately improving the, the content and the art that we all get to consume. It's very exciting. Um, really shifting from that very serious question. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to sort of ask a light question of like what, you know, it sounds like you're working a lot and you consume content even when you're not working, but when you're not doing that, what are sort of some of your other like hobbies or things you do for fun? Um, maybe we have to go back pre-pandemic to find those, but Nice. Um, I think for me, my big one, which I'm very proud we've kept this up, but Sarah Diaz in the chat, uh, she and I play tennis together every Saturday morning. <laughs> um, and it's, we're not good, um, at all, but it's, <laughs> um, but it's really a fun one because I, I grew up playing tennis and I think I like at the beginning of the pandemic, I was so like dejected of what about life and everything. And I, it's been a great way to like, A, have something to look forward to every week of like, oh my God, I get to A, see my best friend for and I get to be outside and I get to just like move my body slightly and be like, great, I worked out, I'm done for the day. Um, but for me, that's been a big one. Um, I don't know. I watched, I mean, technically this is work, so it's a really bad answer, but I watched so much TV um, and certain shows do bring me such a genuine joy. And some of them I watch like, because it's my client show or whatever, but there are some that I watch and I'm like, oh my God, this is such a fun experience. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else I do and what other hobbies I have. <laughs> I would hang out with my dog a lot. Um, and that's maybe it, that's maybe all I do. That, that is sounds beautiful. That sounds so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and also how cute that you play tennis with Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's certainly been a, an interesting year for hobbies. I, I mean, like I, I've gotten um, definitely experimental with like cooking and baking, which has been fun. Um, I, let's see, I love, love doing a little, little uh, apartment yoga when I can. Um, very, I, so because we read so many scripts, I cannot read books, but I'm very into audiobooks. So like the audiobook novel, like I have cycled through a lot this year. Um, and that's been calming for me without having to like read more than we already do. Um, and I just, I, we, my boyfriend and I, we hang with our families. We were just, just trying to decompress a little. <laughs> Yes, that that makes sense. I Chelsea, when you said you watch a lot of TV, I'm wondering what are what are you watching? What movies are you oh, seeing? What, what, are you watching TV? what am I not watching? Um uh oh my god, I watch a lot and I do I switch between old and new. So I my big pandemic thing, which I think everyone has probably experienced, is like I was like, I just want to watch some fun older shows. So I started with my all-time favorite of Gilmore Girls, which I did a full rewatch of, except for the last season because it's bad. Um, and then I moved on and did like the more current things. I think my favorite, it's easier to say my favorite shows because I'm constantly watching a lot of shows, but I, okay, I'm thinking of my favorites. Um, I really enjoyed Mrs. Maisel. The new season I think came out like the first week of the pandemic or something, which feels like 80 years ago, but I love that show. It's so good. It's so well done. It's amazing. Um, I May Destroy You is very amazing and tough to watch. I binged it, which I wouldn't advise. Um, it's a show that you should watch and then take a break and then watch more of. Um, 
WandaVision was my absolute favorite this year. I was obsessed with it. I'm a big Marvel person. Um, absolutely loved it. I just finished Falcon and Winter Soldier of Last Night, which I didn't love as much, but it is very good. Um, I'm also currently watching Shadow and Bone, which I find very fun. I didn't read the books, but I am enjoying the show. Oh my God. I also watched all almost all the seasons of Criminal Minds, <laughs> which like I also don't really advise because it will only make you think everyone's a murderer, <laughs> but I did that recently. Uh, this past weekend, I rewatched Arrested Development, which Sarah is also rewatching. So that was a fun rewatch. I don't know. It's like, uh, it's almost unhealthy how much I watch, but <laughs> that is my answer. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where my, my I really want to hear this answer. <laughs> I feel like she's gonna have really good rest. Oh, oh did I freeze? Oh, you're back. Oh my you're god. Back. Okay, can you? <laughs> no, I, I, I like. I feel like I watch like an absurd amount too, and like, um. Oh my goodness! But you named you named some of the shows that I just loved. I loved Mrs. Maisel. I loved um, Wandavision. I almost finished with, so please don't tell me what happened. I know I'm behind. Yeah, you finished. Oh I, I, will. I will. It's so it's so so good. I loved over this last year. I loved Ozark. I loved Better Call Saul. This last season of Better Call Saul was really fantastic. Um, loved I May Destroy You as well. I just like cried my eyes out through five episodes of It's a Sin. That was really um, gorgeous. Um, we watch a lot of documentaries. That's, I, I absolutely love things in the unscripted space. Um, like David Attenborough can make you cry over like a polar bear, like no one else can. Um, it, it gotta be honest, yeah, there's some reality TV in there as well, but don't, don't tell. Uh, <laughs> no, I watch so much reality don't worry it's a big <laughs> part of my watching life <laughs> there's there's just so much to watch I'm trying to think what else what else was in this last year it's all blurring together um I'm really into the serpent on Netflix at the moment I've just like kind of flown through that which is fine um I should have my list handy but uh, anyway I was keeping a list was, on my phone and it got very out of control really fast <laughs> It, it does you see like you start to realize I'm, I'm like what what was this year what was that what was last year like oh, but yeah. it's it, it's fun like that's there there are so many like people involved in all of these things like again like you, you gotta do it for work it's, and if I must I have to I want to watch all the tv yeah great now I have a watch list for the net and this will get me through the next year of whatever's coming our way um well, I think as we sort of approach the end of our hour, I think I want to I want to pose the question: Looking ahead, what's what's next? Um, you know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. What are what are you looking forward to? Um, what's what's ahead? Oh, I mean, well, hopefully, uh, in in this year, we're talk going into the office. So I'm going to start with meeting some coworkers in person <laughs> before I get too crazy ahead of myself, which I'm honestly so excited to do. Like it, it's, this is such a fun social job. Um, and I've really, really missed the collaborative part of it. Um, or at least it's still very collaborative with the in-person collaboration. Um, and I think, you know, I, over the next however many years for me, it's just a question of like growing clients that I really believe in it there's just so much like joy in getting to like call someone with their first job or their first studio directing job their first writing job whatever it is um that feeling doesn't get old and you know I'm in a new place where I get to pursue the people that I'm super passionate about and help grow their careers and it takes time that's that's the one thing the movie business is very slow you can be, you know, like I think Chelsea and I have both probably, you know, even starting off as assistants um, worked where you would see one project and you would think it was going to go, you'd think it was going to go and, you know, you'd be there for years and maybe it went four years later, it still hasn't gone. Um, so there's a lag time in this business. Um, but again, for me, it's just looking forward to getting to continue to grow that client roster and really help people get those jobs. 
I agree with that answer. I'm seeing um, some of my vaccinated colleagues tomorrow and I'm like thrilled because we, I really haven't seen any of them this entire pandemic. So I'm very excited about that. Um, my answer is really similar to Amanda's. I have so many clients who I signed when they were getting their first writing job and they continue to move up in the like hierarchy of the writer's room. And I just like know that eventually they're going to be show running their own show and all that. And so it's like very exciting to me to be on that journey. And I can't wait until like one of those clients is the one being like my show sold to Netflix or wherever. And I get to be a part of that. And like, be like, I was there in the beginning. This is amazing. Um, so yeah, I would say just the same as Amanda, like really growing those clients and seeing where they go and continuing to sign new people, I think is always really exciting. Wonderful. Well, that, that feels like a really positive place to sort of end things, I suppose. I, I feel like, thank you for letting us kind of go in so many directions. I feel like I really got such an insight into, into your world, which is so, which is so nice. And I hope everyone else feels the same way. Um, it, and it's so cool too, because you're, you both clearly love what you do and it's, it's really fun to hear you talk about it and the passion behind it. Um, obviously we all just love each other and are obsessed with each other. So this was, this was great. Um, so yeah, just thank you for sharing all of this time with us and all of your insights. And thank you to, of course, to everyone who joined us and kind of for supporting this whole speaker series through the, the last year. Um, we are planning to be back again in the fall. So I hope everyone will kind of continue to join us. Um, but Chelsea and Amanda, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was so lovely. Thanks, Thanks Megan. Megan. All right, everyone have a great evening.